Kay Burley Show. Uh, what's your biggest issue, problem, as Foreign Secretary? Well, I think the biggest challenge we have at the moment is that the international order is changing and we have this system that really Britain helped create uh, under Churchill's leadership uh, after 45 where we've had peace, prosperity, growth in democracy across the world and now that all feels like it's being challenged in a pretty serious way and uh, there are lots of things that really worry us. Uh, the behaviour of Russia is perhaps top of the list at the moment after what happened at Salisbury. Um, but if you look at the Middle East, there are some really worrying things. And, and Britain has a very, very important role. We are one of the permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, we have a special responsibility. And sometimes at home, we don't appreciate uh, just how respected the British voice is. But obviously, in the context of Brexit, it's very important for us to make people understand that Britain is out there. Uh, we're fighting for our national interest, for our citizens uh, like Nazanin, uh, but also we want to make sure that the world stays peaceful, stable, and the things that have led to so many advances for humanity are protected. Okay, lots to get our teeth in there. Let's start with Russia then, should we, seeing as you uh, listed it at top of your agenda. How did your meeting with Sergei Lavrov go, the Foreign Minister? Well, I think the diplomatic phrase we use is a frank exchange of views. Um, what did um, you say to it was it was pretty tough because it is not acceptable for Russia to um, instruct two GRU agents to use chemical weapons on British soil the first time it's ever happened. Uh, this is a very significant thing and the significance isn't just about a, a bilateral spat between Russia and the UK. Uh, we have international norms where you don't use chemical weapons. These are, after nuclear weapons, these are the most horrible weapons that you can use. And recently those norms have been changing. We've seen um, Assad using them in Syria and, and now uh, the Russians using them on the streets of Britain. And it would be a terrible step back for the world if we went to a situation where using these horrible, horrible weapons uh, just became normal. And we don't want that to happen, not for Britain's sake, not for the world's sake. And that's why our message to Russia is very straightforward. If you do this, the price will be too high. But they did do it. They did it. Um, and I think one of the reasons that they did it, incidentally, is that the last time uh, this happened back in 2005 uh, with the Litvinenko poisoning, uh, they feel they got away with it. And that's why Theresa May's reaction this time has been very different. And I am sure that in the inner recesses of the Kremlin, if they're reflecting on whether that was a smart thing to do, they must be wondering because they can't have been expecting Theresa May to put together a coalition that saw 153 Russian spies expelled from capitals in uh, 28 countries across the world. So they paid a very high diplomatic price, uh, but they need to understand that uh, it will not be a comfortable place for Russia in the world if this is the way they behave. So what did you say to Lavrov? I said to him that countries like Russia and Britain need to be standing together uh, to make the world a peaceful place. And if one of us is sending army officers onto the streets of the other and using chemical weapons, uh, that's not going to happen. And that is the wrong thing to do. So it could affect the peace between our two countries? Well, it clearly affects the relations between our two countries. Um, no, I don't think there's any uh, possibility of, of war or anything like that but Russia has a lot of influence across the world and we want them to be a force for good in the world um, as is Britain and the one thing now that is really at stake the thing that people like Assad other dictators around the world are wondering is is it now okay to use chemical weapons and uh, Britain is saying no and Britain is leading the international coalition that is saying anyone who goes down this route will find the prices too high. To what extent do our security services have to accept some responsibility for what happened given that these two men, we knew that well, at least one of them was a GRU agent, he was uh, honoured, decorated by Putin himself, and yet they got visas? Well, you know, these were, um, you know, we think they were aliases, um, and so uh, they um, applied for visas and it's, it's very difficult in a situation like that to uh, weed people out. But let's be clear, um, we don't stop 
Russian uh, military coming to the UK. They don't stop our military going to Russia. Uh, what is then important is what they do when they arrive. And of course, uh, when something like this happens, it is very, very serious. To what extent do you think the at least one death and um, several people um, taken uh, seriously ill, including uh, a police officer, um, leads to the desk of the president? Well, we all think that it's unlikely that a great deal happens in Russia without the, uh, the nod coming from the highest levels. Um, we are being very careful about what we say because we want to be sure that everything we say is properly backed with evidence. Um, but what I would say to President Putin is that in the end, it is his choice as to whether Russia is on the wrong side of international opinion or the right side. And if they become the major country, the only major country on the Security Council that is giving the nod to the use of chemical weapons, then that puts Russia in a very different place. And if his great dream is for Russia to be shown respect by the international community, this is the wrong way to do it. You talk about uh, diplomats being expelled right around the world. We saw as a response to that what President Putin did. He basically said, these, he paraded these two guys on the, te on the telly. He said that they were uh, tourists um, and there was absolutely nothing to worry about. Didn't know what we were talking about. The way to uh, impact on Russia and on President Putin, some might say, is um, through financial sanctions. You do have the ability to do that, but up until now, under the uh, wealth orders uh, that were brought in in 2017, nothing's been done. Well, we, that's, I think, unfair. I mean, we have to follow due process in this country. That is one of the things that we're proud of. And there is a, a police process uh, and there is a, a large number of investigations going in place so that we can actually implement these unexplained wealth orders. Um, and I think it's really important to say that, uh, you know, thanks to the extraordinary work of people like Bill Browder and the Magnitz Magnitsky Act that has happened both here and also in the UK, uh, we are finding ways of putting economic pressure on Russia because one thing that is very clear is that some of these people at the top of the Russian regime have accumulated huge amounts of wealth outside Russia which they want to protect and, and we should not be complicit in that uh, if they are breaching these very important international norms. So they need to be worried you're coming for them as far as money is concerned? They need to understand that if they continue to behave this way the price will always be too high. Can we talk about Iran? Um, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, you spoke to the um, Iranian uh, counterpart here as well. Um, things looked as though they were going to be uh, that we were going in the right direction. We, we, you tweeted um, about the furlough that she was out for 72 hours, and we expected to be coming back to the United Kingdom very quickly. What went wrong? Well, I, um, I have a four-year-old daughter myself, and uh, and maybe that's why I. Um, feel so strongly for the agony that both Richard and Nazanin are going through at the moment. And uh, the truth is that uh, Iran has made a decision to uh, detain innocent people. And it's very important to say it's not just Nazanin. Uh, we only talk about names when the families are willing to talk about names. And there are other families who are suffering as much as uh, Richard Radcliffe is, but they don't want those names talked about. Um, but they are detaining innocent people as a, an instrument of diplomatic leverage. And we can't do that, and we can't accept it. And uh, we've just been talking about Russia, but even Russia doesn't do this. You know, Brits who go to Russia, uh, on the whole, uh, don't have to worry about the kind of things that Nazanin is, is going. So I had a very, very frank discussion with the Iranian foreign minister. I went through this. Um, the Iranian regime is very complicated. I think probably the foreign affairs ministry of the the people who most want to solve this issue. But I made it very clear that our policy to Iran is not settled and there will be consequences uh, if they continue to think that this is a tool of diplomacy. It should not be. It did look as though, as I said, that she was on her way home. Um, she isn't. We don't know what went wrong. One thing that might have gone wrong was that uh, British Airways cancelled its direct flights to Tehran on the very same day that she was released. The Iranians lost face as a result. Could that have had anything to do with it? Well, British Airways have to take their decisions uh, as an independent commercial entity. We don't have any influence over that. But my point really is, is exactly this, 
that well, whether Naznin, whether Naznin is in prison or not has got absolutely nothing to do with trade relations with Iran, whether airlines are flying between London and Tehran. And it is unacceptable for the Iranian regime to punish innocent people because of uh, commercial decisions, trade decisions, diplomatic decisions that they don't like. This is not the way that countries interact with each other in the modern world. And Iran needs to understand uh, that we will not let it rest. Um, you know, Nazanin and her husband Richard, they are incredibly brave people. You've been talking to, to Richard. Um, amazingly brave in impossible circumstances but with respect, and we Prime are Secretary, not going to let it they, rest. They are the flag carrier for the United Kingdom and um, we know that the uh, authorities do not want to lose face in Iran and they lost face in Iran when British Airways cancelled their flights. Should they at least not have checked with you first before they, they carried out that decision? Well, we stand Did they check with the Foreign Office first? They don't check with us. Uh, they, aware they are, of it? We, are, we were always aware that this was a possibility, but we didn't know that this was uh, their decision until they took their decision. But, you know, there is absolutely no link at all. You know, we, that was at least unfortunate. Let me put it another way, Kay. There are 193 nations in the United Nations uh, where we are now in New York. And all of them have uh, frictions and tensions, but it's only Iran that decides when it doesn't like something that another country does, that it's going to lock up an innocent person who just happens to be visiting Tehran. And that is not acceptable. It has to stop, and we won't let it rest. Uh, we've got a lot to go through, and I know that your time is very limited. So let me ask you about Saudi Arabia, if I may. You said that we need to share the same values as our allies. What values do we share with Saudi Arabia? Well, we have um, a, a strategic partnership with Saudi Arabia. Uh, we both work very closely together on counterterrorism. Uh, there are it's other not things. Not values, though, are there, Foreign Secretary? I mean, um, that's self-interest. Um, intelligence is, is a commodity, isn't it? It's not a value. I think it's both. But I would say that there are things that we don't agree with Saudi Arabia on. There are um, things to do with uh, the treatment of women, for example, in Saudi Arabia, where they're making good progress. Things are going in the right direction. Women are, are driving for the first time. Uh, but we'd like them to go a lot further. Um, but I think uh, the truth is that we have uh, big concerns about the way the war is being prosecuted in Yemen. And uh, we use the fact that we're a partner of Saudi Arabia to exert as much influence as we can uh, to try and get a solution because we are the um, Security Council member at the United Nations responsible for Yemen. Uh, we have a special responsibility to try and see things progress away from the humanitarian tragedy that we have at the moment. But you talked about red lines, um, and we have to accept our, uh, our level of responsibility for this humanitarian disaster that's happening at, at the moment in the Yemen. Um, Saudi Arabia, supported by us, accused by the UN of war crimes, thousands of civilian deaths. At the school bus, we saw a school bus was obliterated, absolutely disgusting behaviour. Surely that is a red line for us. It is totally unacceptable, and incidentally, it wasn't just that incident. There's been a range of incidents. I think there were three separate incidents in August that happened, and I spoke to the Saudi Arabian foreign minister in the strongest possible terms. I'm seeing him actually later today Can in New York. Him? This is totally unacceptable. Saudi Arabia has actually said they broke their own rules of engagement. They're having an investigation. They will hold uh, the individuals responsible to account. But the big question with uh, Yemen is whether the Saudis and the Emiratis who are also involved in this conflict understand that this is not going to be solved uh, with a military solution. Uh, there has to be a political process and Britain with our influence as a, as a partner of Saudi Arabia in the region we are saying to them there has to be a political process and that's the message I'll be giving today. Okay so that that's, is a red line for us what's happening in Yemen. What about you talked about women in Saudi Arabia let me talk, I'm sure you're aware of the female political activist but for the benefit of our viewers Israel Gangam she is scheduled to be beheaded her crime was to take part in a peaceful anti-government protest. Um, what are we doing what are you doing to try to stop that execution? Well we feel very strongly that... Is it a red line? Uh, when things like uh, that happen, when... Uh, I think, let's be clear, human rights abuses, wherever they happen, whether it's uh, Saudi Arabia, whether it's Burma, uh, whether it's Yemen, uh, they are something that Britain feels very strongly about. We are one of the countries in the world that uh, has set up the international order and we want to make it a taboo for these things to happen. And uh, with different countries, uh, we behave in different ways. Now, with countries like Saudi Arabia 
um, countries like China, uh, the way you make the most progress is by talking to them in private. If you talk about these things publicly, uh, you lose the access. They say, we don't want to deal with you, and you put yourself in a position where you have no influence over what's happening. So when I go to Saudi Arabia, when I go to China, when I go to countries like that, I raise these issues. Um, I, I fly the flag for British values, but I don't think they're just British values. I think they're universal values, and I think it's very important people in those countries know what we stand for. Okay, but you know, we our arms sales to Saudi, 4.6 billion pounds. Uh, that's the reason that we continue to have a relationship with Saudi Arabia, isn't it? No. Um, we have a commercial relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, we have a strategic relationship. Um, there are bombs that have not gone off in the streets of Britain because of the counterintelligence work that we've done with Saudi Arabia. Um, and we're working with them to try and create peace in the region. But uh, the truth is that we also want to make sure that all countries everywhere behave in a humane and civilized way. And uh, we do everything as, that we can to try and influence countries like Saudi. President Trump, do you appreciate his values? Well, President Trump uh, is someone who uh, makes very strong statements on social media. I think it's fair to say that he's been more active on social media than um, any other president. Uh, we agree with some of them. We don't agree with others. Uh, when I was health secretary, I went into battle with him on Twitter when he criticized the NHS. So I don't pretend that we agree with him on everything. But I think you have to look at what he does as much as what he says. And the truth is that America is our closest ally in the world. They uh, support the international order that we built together with America. And when it comes to issues like Russia that we talked about earlier, uh, America expelled as many diplomats as the whole of the EU put together. So they are with us. And um, I think that uh, relationship is incredibly important. Yeah. For but let me pick you up on that, if I may, please, Foreign Secretary. When the US expelled those Russian diplomats in solidarity with us over the Salisbury poisoning, um, the Washington Post says that the president was furious, felt misled, and a lot of curse words were used. That strikes uh, most people in this country and in the United Kingdom as plausible. So it does look as though we didn't necessarily have the support from the president that we were expecting it. And it's the people that work with him and for him that, are, uh, that you have to do business with. Well, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they have the same fierce and vigorous internal debates about issues as, as we have in the UK. But in the end, the decision was taken by the president to expel those Russian spies in solidarity with the UK because he recognized that, uh, like us, we have to defend the international order. And I think uh, with President Trump, you know, we have to be careful uh, not to get drawn into some of the domestic political issues. I'm the British Foreign Secretary. Uh, but we have to recognize in international affairs, there is a difference with his predecessors. Uh, this is someone who is prepared to take risks to change things. And I think the best example of that is what's happening in North Korea, where everyone in the United States was telling him uh, don't go and meet Kim in Singapore unless he promises to give you something in return. And Trump, over all that, he went, he took a very big risk. And now we are seeing the first possibility of a breaking of the deadlock in North Korea. So uh, this is someone who is prepared to shake things up. Um, and we want to be the people inside the tent talking to him as his best friend internationally. Um, but making sure that we're working together to develop, defend the values we both agree with. He also with. had a 90-minute conversation with just the interpreters with Putin, didn't he, during the Helsinki um, summit. I mean, what was happening at the Foreign Office when that was going on? You must have all been biting your fingernails, wondering what on earth they might have been talking about. Well, Never um, happened before. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, disappear in a moment to go off to the Security Council, but um, you know, look at what he was doing there. Um, his view about Putin, and he said this to me, uh, when I met him when he came to the UK is that this is a man with his finger on the nuclear button, one of the big nuclear powers, and America has a responsibility to have a relationship with him, a dialogue with him, uh, to make sure that we minimize uh, the possibility of unintended uh, accidental conflict. And so he feels he has a responsibility to do that, and that's why he was prepared to take that risk. Um, and, you know, he got quite a lot of flack for um, some of the things that happened in the press conference afterwards. But this is a man who is prepared to take risks and Britain needs to be the trusted voice inside the tent, uh, talking to him as his best friend internationally. Okay. 
at helping him succeed. I know we've got another few minutes as agreed with you, so let me move on to Brexit if I may. Um, the Chequers deal is dead, finished, done. Uh, now is the time um, to consider alternatives. What's, what's your alternative? Um, I, I don't agree with that. Um, and I think now is the time for a change from the European Union. We cannot have a situation in a negotiation between a sovereign power like Britain, uh, one of the biggest countries in the EU, and the EU, where every time we come up with a proposal, uh, instead of engaging with that proposal, they simply say, I'm sorry, uh, that doesn't work, come back with something else. Uh, negotiations require two parties to engage seriously. That hasn't been happening. Um, and you know, Britain is not going to keep coming back with more. We have put on the table some practical proposals uh, which mean that we can honour the spirit and letter of the referendum and uh, reassure businesses that they can have the frictionless trade that they want. They're sensible proposals. We now need some engagement from the EU. Okay, but, but that's not in the form of checkers, is it? Because the European leaders have rejected it. Um, a lot of your backbenchers have rejected it. The Labour Party have said that they won't vote for it if it comes if it, when it comes to the House of Commons. Checkers is dead. It needs to be something else. What's the alternative? Well, um, we are prepared to have a, a proper discussion. I, I would simply say that at this stage in the negotiations, um, it was always going to be like this. There was always going to be a moment where everyone was looking into the abyss. Um, but now what we need is calm heads to prevail. We need people to look at the very practical proposals that the Prime Minister has put on the table. And I think when they look at them, they will realise that actually this is a very sensible way to deal with all the different tensions, all the different trade-offs. But um, the Secretary, they did look at them and they humiliated her when she went to Europe last week. Well, I think that uh, she stood up for Britain. She and did, what she but... did was she made it clear uh, that she has a bottom line. And that they needed to hear that. And I don't think they treated her with respect. They didn't. And I think they can see now that they have uh, a, someone who has deep principles always treats people with the greatest uh, of courtesy, but never mistake British politeness for British weakness. We're the kind of country when our back's against the wall, we fight back. And from the European point of view, uh, if we ended up with a messy divorce, uh, with huge acrimony, it would take a generation to put right. And I think that would be a real tragedy for the whole of Europe. So I think they have a responsibility now to sit down and engage properly. So do you think that Chequers is, still has uh, some hope of being passed? Um, or do you think we need to move more towards the Canada deal? Well, I think it's the basis of an agreement. And we are very confident that in the end, uh, calm heads will prevail and we can get an agreement. We, we've never said that we're not prepared to uh, negotiate on uh, individual elements, but what we have said is that we will never sign up to something that is not consistent with the letter and spirit of what the British people voted for. We are one of the oldest democracies in Europe and that is the thing we have to respect first and foremost. But, you, but we, we have heard from the Prime Minister that no deal is better than a bad deal. You have previously said that, uh, that we would regret that for generations. Um, if it's not checkers, um, could we be finding ourselves in a position where we do leave without a deal? Um, I will answer that, but then I'm going to have to be on my way, I'm afraid, Kay. Um, let's be clear. Um, because we would never sign up to something that is uh, not consistent with what the British people voted for, then of course it is possible that we don't end up with a deal. And uh, we hope that doesn't happen. I've always said that if we don't end up with a deal, Britain would find a way to prosper and flourish. We've had you know, this is a challenge, but we've had far bigger challenges in our history before. And this is a country that, that knows how to fight its way out of difficult situations, and that is what we would do. But for the continent of Europe, let's not forget that since 1945, we have all prospered. We've all become richer than ever before in our history because we've had peace, uh, because we've had uh, uh, a system where large countries haven't been walking into small countries. And Britain and its continental partners have been working together. So let's not put that under threat by a huge, messy, ugly, horrible divorce that's wholly avoidable. Uh, this is a moment to sit around the table and come to a sensible deal that works for Britain and works for the EU. I know you've got to go. Um, I'm going to ask you this. I, I know um, that you're not, if I ask you about whether you want to be leader or not, you won't tell me. So what I'm going to ask you instead, I'm going to put it a different way. We have got a campaign at Sky at the moment called Make Debates Happen. We want political leaders to have to face up to each other ahead of any general election campaign. As you know, it's not written in law at the moment. We are trying to press for that. What do you think? 
Well, we have a, a leader with Theresa May, and I just, uh, the way that she engages ahead of elections is, is obviously a matter for her, but I just want to make this point, if I may. Um, don't underestimate Theresa May. Um, I think what's happening at the moment is that, uh, you know, after that very difficult general election, maybe some people in Britain uh, didn't appreciate the steel um, at the heart of that lady, and that we are led by someone very tough and very resilient. And I think now people in Europe are beginning to realize the same. And I think that uh, underestimating, underestimating Theresa May is one of the biggest mistakes that anyone can make right now. Um, <laughs> Talking about steely ladies, have you apologised to your wife yet for getting her nationality wrong? You know, I am blessed not <laughs> just to have a, a beautiful, lovely wife, but also someone with a great sense of humour. And when I got her nationality wrong, uh, I was incredibly nervous. I picked up the phone <laughs> to apologise to her, and uh, the first word she said to me was konnichiwa, which is hello in Japanese. So, uh, <laughs> so she has a great Chinese sense of humour, um, but. Uh, uh, sushi is banned from the Hunt household for a while. <laughs> Foreign Secretary. Thank Absolutely. you very much.